Hi, good evening. Welcome back for yet another session of Kitab Khana Live. Today we have with us author, editor, translator Rajat Chaudhary. Rajat Chaudhary has published six books in two languages, including novels, short stories, translations, and edited works. He is a climate activist and recipient of several writing fellowships. Book Riot listed his latest, The Butterfly Effect, among the 50 must-read eco-disaster novels. He would be joining us today as we speak about The Butterfly Effect. So before uh, he comes uh, on board, let me just give you a blurb, uh, read the blurb of The Butterfly Effect. A self-obsessed Calcutta detective who goes by the last name Carr, an enigmatic internet cafe hostess in Seoul, and a hotshot gen geneticist laboring away on a top secret corporate project. These are just a few pieces in a puzzle that need to be put together to explain a world sucked into the whirlpool of the butterfly effect. In the decaying capital city of a near future dark land, which covers large swaths of Asia, Captain Old, an off duty policeman, receives the news that might help to unravel the roots of the scourge that has ravaged the continent. As stories coalesce into stories, welding past, present and future together, will a Makaba death in a small English town or the disappearance of Indian tourists in Korea help to blow away the dusts of time? From utopian communities of Asia to prison camps of Pyongyang and from gene labs of Europe to the violent streets of Darkland, riveted by civil war infested by genetically engineered fighters, this time-travelling novel crosses continents, weaving mystery, adventure and romance, gradually fixing its gaze on the sway of the unpredictable over our lives. It's just waiting for Rajat to join us. He should be online very soon. Hi everybody, thank you for joining us this evening. We're just waiting for Rajat to join. Let me just send him a reminder that we are online. If you have any questions for Rajat, please leave them in the comments below. Someone from our team is going to be having a look at the comments throughout the conversation and we would take them after the session is done. Thank you, Suleha. Thank you so many people for joining us this evening. Hi, Amman. Hi, Shivani. Hi, Rajat. So we finally have Rajat here. Hi Rajat, Hi. thank you for being to come you. on Instagram with for a live session with us, and a special thanks to Niyogi Books for facilitating the same. Rajat, I just finished reading The Butterfly Effect this afternoon, and there are several questions that are fluttering in my mind about the premise of the novel. And uh, you know, at some points, the novel reminded me of the Orwellian 1984, you know, with its modified food and the neglected many. So, what was your inspiration uh, behind writing The Butterfly Effect? Okay, first, let me thank Kitab Khanna for arranging this wonderful uh, series of events. Also for inviting me for this one. Uh, the book uh, 
let me show the book first. It's uh, the butterfly yes. effect and published by Nyogi. Uh, there are several inspirations actually. One of the major inspirations is my activism. I had been a climate change activist for now at least 15 to 20 years. When climate change was just a new word, most of the people didn't know what climate change was. We were lobbying with industry and, and with governments also to shift from uh, polluting substances to more climate friendly options. So uh, my activism was one of the major inspirations. But beyond that, of course, my reading and other writing. And Orwell, of, co of, of course, Orwell, uh, Elder Suxley. Elder Suxley's work, you find, uh, you find that there's a lot of genetics there. So maybe mm. uh, because this book also has a lot of things. Uh, brave new life. world. Yeah. Brave yeah. new world. Yeah. Brave new world and brave new world disease. So uh, Huxley was an early inspiration. And my, and my environment work, health and environment work, where we were uh, working on GMOs also, genetically modified organic uh, food stuff, animals and plants. All of that uh, has played into writing and, and nowadays uh, there are more and more this kind of books coming out so i read most of the margaret Atwood is one of them so then uh, many others uh, cormac mccarthy cormac mccarthy hasn't written about genetics but he has written uh, real dystopian stuff so all of these mm -hmm. plus my uh, activist work which mm -hmm. has health and environment a strong health and environment component including genetics uh, gmo all of yeah. Lovely. Lovely. So, uh, you know, how do you feel about climate change or environmental crisis, which plays part in, you know, all the different places in your novel? So do you think the pandemic, uh, this was a question that Sudeshna asked one of our readers, asking that, do you think the pandemic and climate change have any correlation uh, in some ways, the current pandemic and uh, climate change? Yeah, see, see what is happening is most of the things that are happening around us, uh, that is happening to the environment, disease and climate change, pollution, all of these have the fingerprints of human beings on them. And climate change and pandemic, this particular pandemic, they are kind of, you know, cognate. They have started from the, for the same reason, human beings have been involved. So there are several theories uh, that link climate change to this pandemic. One of those is, uh, you know, there's this Professor Bendel, Jim Bendel, teaches in Cambodia. <laughs> He's saying that the bats, where coronavirus is, bats are the natural host of coronavirus. And these bats have been displaced because of climate change, because of the warming planet, from their natural habitat. And now they're living closer to humans, mm -hmm. which is why, which has given the opportunity for this virus from jumping from bats to humans. That's one of the theories. And there are several others which can, uh, which links climate change to disease. Not mm -hmm. only disease, like you, you, you know, you might now find very uh, poisonous snakes on the beaches of California. And the habitats of the snakes are very, very far away, but they are now moving. All of these things are happening because climate change. So yes, uh, the pandemic can be uh, connected to climate change in several ways. And to human action also, like we are cutting down trees, we are building a road to forest creatures. We are logging for wood. We have made this uh, chicken into a kind of uh, a factory. You know, the broiler chicken, it's like a factory to produce meat for the meat. All of these, <laughs> all of these animals carry viruses. Forests are full of animals, carry viruses, dangerous viruses. But the viruses were circulating very slowly in the wild. They were not coming close to humans. But now that humans are starting to move, expanding urbanization, and all these things are happening. Humans are coming closer to viruses, and viruses are getting an opportunity to jump in. So, this mm -hmm. so yes, uh, some climate change can be implicated for several things, including this matter. If we leave out the other theories about, you know, laboratory development, bioweapons and all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's more fictionalized than it's conspiracy theory rather than, you know, what could actually work. There are a lot of theories going around. So, but yeah. Uh, so, you know, the book is uh, set in, uh, largely set in three countries. 
it's uh, india uk and korea so what necessitated this white canvas you know why why were we jumping uh, so many uh, countries across the uh, across the book i think the simple answer is you know environmental problems self and environmental problems are borderless they cross continents uh, easily they cross uh, country borders very easily and because the book is about that uh, it's mostly a health and environment issue that is the theme of it so naturally uh, the story has to move from one part of the world to others and then as you have seen you have read the book where the characters are also from several places if you are writing yeah. about climate change you cannot really avoid that if you read amita bose's latest novel a gun island it is also spread over several places it's in sundarban yeah. then it goes to italy and then it goes to the U- us and climate change itself climate change pandemics these are you know these are kind of global phenomena they have all kinds of uh, ramifications across the world across peoples and across countries climate change is mm-hmm. even more because from wildfires to migration everything is happening because of climate change and they initially they seem unrelated but when you're writing a novel yeah. you can do that you can expand the setting and bring, bring it all in you can make the connections yeah you can make it. So uh, you know when uh, uh, when the novel began the butterfly effect began it was set in a it is set in a dystopian future uh, a dystopian future of calcutta largely the canvas you know seemed uncannily real to me like being from calcutta being born and brought up there and like the current times with the dread and the disease which eats into the city at its core and yet there is a section of society which continues to live on as if nothing has really happened so do you foresee such an end to civilization do, or do you think this pandemic will actually help us to get our act together and like you know behave differently yeah this is a good question actually uh, we are not futurists we cannot say uh, what will happen but uh, we can look for certain signals uh, what i hope and what might be already happening is the climate change movements which have been energized because of people like the greater thunder others these climate change movements will be joining hands with all these good people who are working for us to help humanity in this hour of crisis these two things might join all the goodness that is also flowing during this pandemic that is around us those energies will join hands with the climate movement and hopefully uh, we will have a slightly better world that's possible but side by side with this there are these you know these uh, armed gunboat scenarios you read the paper the indians from the us they are kind of escaping to new zealand that they have already built their bunkers in case there's a doomsday scenario there's a nuclear war or a famine so it's already happening there are these group of people people who are kind of escaping into their safe haven already built already un- underground or in other countries like new zealand New Zealand has a lot of these underground bunkers where big people are hiding. So, utopia and dystopia will coexist. But when you are writing, when you are writing a book, nowadays I have begun to feel that uh, you should also talk about politics, not only darkness. Because it yeah. gives people hope. Otherwise, it's all despair. So, uh, for this book, Butterfly Effect, if you, if you read till the end, you will find that Uh, there's uh, an indication that it will the story will go on because the antidote hasn't been found and actually i yeah. uh, make this into a trilogy so i'm hoping that the next book that just about to come will have a more positive future a better future people working together for a better future so yeah let's so see. when <laughs> so when can we expect the second book to come out now i don't know it takes a lot of time i don't know. Two, three years, who knows? And doing other work parallel to that, yeah, transformation. Yeah. Yes, we've uh, we've just also read your translation of Calcutta Nights. Even that's that's really really beautiful. Uh, so, you know, when we see that parts of your novel uh, has got these amazing moving descriptions of the mountains of Korea, it almost transports you. to that magical valley and you know you evoke such a beautiful landscape as if you know you've been familiar of that like a native so 
can you tell us a bit what went into the research of writing such beautiful landscapes and what inspired you like have you lived in korea been to those areas and hence yeah yeah i've been to these those areas of course <laughs> otherwise it's difficult to write you can write from imagination totally kafka has this book called america mm -hmm. which is not one of his very common or popular books kafka never went to america but he had written a book called america and it's a beautiful it, it's his last novel unfinished so yeah that aside i did visit korea uh, and stayed there for uh, about a month more than a month on a fellowship and i have visited visited these places but i did a lot of research also i made a lot of friends and while i was writing the novel i was asking them again and again every point i tell them and my habit is to go into detail in when i'm writing so that sometimes a bad habit they have told me but if you go into too much detailing uh, you know the story can get stalled too much, too much yeah. detail of the reader yeah you can get uh, a bit slowed down but yeah that's how i write <laughs> Uh, I did a lot of research. I met people. I visited these places, the mountains, uh, North Korea, no, <laughs> but yeah, South Korea, of course. Yeah, and, and yeah, the people who lived there again and again, coming back. I took photographs. I took videos. All of those things. I read their literature. Lovely. So, uh, you know, coming back to the GMO uh, topic that uh, we started our conversation with, uh, the novel in novel, you know, there's a debate between uh, Tanmay and David, and they you explain both sides of genetic engineering through their debate, you know, their conversations throughout that uh, period in the novel. So, which side do you lean to more? We are obviously guessing to david's side but what is your personal take on gm crops and how is it actually affecting the environment it's affecting health actually uh, and it can affect the environment also of course i am against gm gmo news of gmo or, or let us say i am against uh, modifying plants genetically modifying plants not always animals because gm technology can be used in medicine isn't it? there are very good gm medicines that are being discovered but to genetically modify plants and make make those part of our uh, daily food food products food and food products like gm tomato gm corn these are very common in some countries it is very dangerous because many of these uh, gm products have uh, effects on human health some of these are well studied some of these are not so well studied so anything from kidney damage to rapid aging to several other things you know uh, allergies several kinds of allergies but those people who are pro gmo they they kind of deny it they say that you no know, uh, there is no good uh, study to prove that gmo is dangerous but the problem is most of the study the studies that they quote have been done on mice and rats and it's really not comparable to humans because my, the the life span of mice and rat is very small compared to a human life So GMO is dangerous. We don't know what these DNA particles when they go into a system, what final effect they will have in the lab. So it is a complete no-no. And then also we have to use several kinds of fertilizers, kinds of pesticides to support those green crops. And these are also dangerous. They give rise to super bugs and things like that. GM cotton in India, not crop, but you know, cotton. That has been a failure. That has, that has been a big failure. And this cotton oil is uh, has slipped into our food products. And some of these edible oils, this cotton oil, from GM cotton is being used, and that is dangerous. So all kinds of things. Another terrible thing happened in India. You know, Centre for Science and Environment, the NGO in Delhi. They did a study about a year or two ago. They found that many of our food products on supermarket shelves, like baby food, like edible oil, these were contaminated <laughs> with GM products. Though GM products haven't been allowed, haven't been, except for cotton, so it's dangerous and it can have a very very bad impact on human. We shouldn't in this country. No country should allow it. So uh, here I would just uh, want to ask you, paperback Mumbaikar. Uh, he asks in the comments below that do GMO foods have carcinogenic effects on humans? it can there are several studies done uh, i i can't tell you exactly what effects on what humans here 
yeah. they, they might they might if they are uh, if dna particles are going into your body they can do anything you don't know what they're doing so it's better you know there's something called the precautionary principle in the biosafety protocol mm. which is uh, agreed by several countries precautionary principle says when a technology is not very well understood it's better to keep away from it rather than use it because there are certain advantages from it. so it's a good idea to use precautionary principle for dangerous technologies like gm food like genetically modified modifying plants so by you you need not know whether it will be specifically causing cancer but it can cause several other things and it's better to use the precautionary principle in all such cases when we don't know what a particular technology like gm will do to us and there are several studies if you go online you'll find that there are list of several kinds of problems kidney damage allergy yes so uh, neeti asks a question uh, in the comments uh, saying what alternatives can we offer to avoid mm -hmm. uh, gmo foods actually we don't need an alternative we already had everything you know? so suddenly these big companies began pushing gmo food they began to say they have now begun to say that uh, they are climate resistant or there will be huge food scarcities in future and gm can uh, supply that that increase mm. demand but these are not true actually if conspicuous consumption in the western advanced countries is controlled there won't be any real food scarcity and there are other ways to manufacture food you know uh, integrated farming and several other technologies if we if we cut down on meat consumption meat consumption is by the way very bad for the planet bad for the environment it causes climate change the the processed meat packing industry causes climate change if we cut down on that we release a lot of pastoral land which can be used for food crops so there are several alternatives we don't need to go to gm to uh, kind of uh, supply food to the world so, yeah that's so that is why if we just take care of the environment the way it is currently we won't have a food shortage and that's what even yeah. and and often traditional methods you know traditional methods of farming where you uh, intercropping where two or three kinds of crop are grown together side by side all these things there are several technologies available old traditional which are good enough we don't need gm actually it was like big company multinational so pushed it and now it's almost everywhere everywhere in the world and because we don't have good laws we have laws which are not implemented it is also slipping into our market so uh, trisha asks uh, in the comments again is that what is integrated farming what is integrated farming okay so it's going very far away from literature now Yes, so yeah, it's actually getting into the actual subject of they want to know what everything about GMO crops, <laughs> how does it affect human health, what are alternatives, <laughs> everything. Not only grow crops, but you have some, you know, uh, you have a, a pond there where there are some ducks, and you use those duck droppings for manure. All kinds of things are integrated together, and you. Uh, and you have a, a crop uh, a patch of crop where some uh, beneficial pests uh, live which can help the other crops all kinds of things have been done together that is integrated part so, so do you think uh, so do you think that the farm that you depicted uh, in the mountains minus where the seeds actually came from would be an example of integrated farming not really because they were only doing rice most Mm, they were mostly doing yeah. rice, and there was a stream there, but there were no ducks or things around. There were no other animals, and uh, and it got damaged very quickly because of this uh, intrusion from the from the GM rice. So that is not integrated. But what happened is in that book, in this book, mm. on the mountain top where the monk lives, hmm. there you have something strange happening because it's so close to the to the valley where uh, these GM crops are destroying the, the other kinds of rice. and uh, people are getting sick nothing is happening there on the mountain top but it's still very close you know crops can uh, cross pollinate the pollen can easily mm -hmm. go from one crop to another so it's an interesting question to ask oneself when you read the book why that place is uh, safe where the monk lived i don't answer yeah. that but it's good to ask yourself 
why nothing happens here despite this dangerous technology lurking around that now interesting interesting i think we'll have to just read it all over again to figure out what is the hidden answer there or probably wait for the sequel to come out yeah yes so Rajat, would you want to at this point read from a little bit from the book so that we can get the questions back on track instead of just talking about GMO? Again, paperback uh, Mumbai Kar actually uh, asked something about this thing. He asked that can GMO crops be our uh, be our way to sustain extraterritorial human civilization by making farming i mean like uh, on other planets given the scarcity of resources so he is probably talking about if and when we go to other planets can we grow gmo crops there uh, to make up for the scarcity resources we go there there are several other uh, good technologies like hydroponics and all which we can use we don't need to go for gm anywhere gm is dangerous gm can harm uh, harm our bodies we don't really know what can happen from it because it's a new technology we are using it for 5 10 years you know there's this uh, thing called golden rice which was developed by uh, swiss and yeah. other and uh, my book is also about the gm rice but it has yeah. never been commercialized it's still being tested some countries are using it some countries are using it because there are problems there are problems with it. if we go to mars and 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 begin to live there we will have better technologies to use you know, safer technologies like hydroponics like there are several other things yeah. we first need to create the soil without soil we cannot live on other planets plants need soil to grow or water water yeah. so that's the answer to your question So, uh, yes. are there any questions, or should I? Uh... Yeah, just Niyati has asked a couple of questions, so I'll just uh, read uh, read them out. Uh, she says, "Just give me a minute. I'll just open it out on the side." So, uh, where do you draw the line between fact and fiction in a science fiction novel like yours, and how much of fact is necessary to make fiction believable? For a book like yeah, for a book like this, it can be totally fictionalized, like uh, you know, uh, interplanetary travel. But I prefer <laughs> to write something which which has which impinges on our lives. So hmm. my books are usually about climate change. The book that I'm writing now, or a book about Calcutta. It depends on the writer. There are no really hard and fast rules. Uh, how how imaginative, how creative you want to be. You can go anywhere. You can go to an, another planet and uh, terraform that, like Kim Stanley Robinson has written about Mars, very far away in our future. Uh, even Mars exploration, we are just having beginning to have Mars exploration. Then we will start living there. I think it depends on the writer because I'm a bit activist-minded. I would always write something which has an implication for readers and people in general, and. Uh, In this context, what is very important is climate change novels. Climate change novels are becoming very, very uh, useful and important for readers because they are allowing people to think climate change differently. We only get you know scientific facts, newspaper mm. uh, reports about cyclone here, a uh, wildfire in Australia, something happening in California. But to connect those things, novels can be very useful. Are very beneficial in that way. So, climate change novels are becoming more and more important, and some uh, writers are telling me, uh, climate change writers, that in future most this thing will become bigger and bigger. Rajat, we just lost you. Uh, your voice didn't come through. Hello. Yeah, Hello? now it's clear. Yeah, now it's clear. So I was saying that climate change novel will become more and more important, and and I prefer to write that kind of fiction, which has a a, a, a strong foundation in facts and which kind of impinges on uh, life of people, and I look at it from a, a slightly activist perspective. Other Thank writers you. can yeah work in another way depends on the writer actually. Sure. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rajat. Now we would love to you to read something from the novel. So, uh, how much time have we got? I can read two small... We've got parts. time. We've got 15-20 minutes. Okay. So, the first section that I'm reading mm -hmm. to you, and let me tell you a bit about the novel first, then that will give a, a, a bit of context. Uh, this is... Uh, the novel begins in a place called Darkland, in a country called Darkland which is in Asia, which is a part of Asia actually. There has been a great war and Asia is now divided into only two regions, the two countries. One is called Dark Land, the other is called Clean Land. Parts of Europe falls under Clean Land. And there's this uh, police hitman there, who is uh, going out from his home late in the night to meet someone called Henry David, who used to be a green activist. Because Henry David has told him, that he has a stash of diaries of a dead scientist, of a dead Indian scientist, a genetist. And these diaries could contain the antidote for an illness which is ravaging the population of Dark. All of Darkland is sick. It's like this pandemic that's going around, a different pandemic. And this pandemic is about aging. Everyone is aging very fast. Like in one year, people are aging 10 years. So that's the pandemic. And this guy is coming from Finland. To meet this police hitman, we don't know why. We, we will find out. In the because he has this diary which says that uh, which has which might have an antidote. So that's how the book begins. And then there are two or three other narratives. One is in South Korea, where a group of travelers from India vanishes. And then there's this old world kind of Bengali detective, you know, eccentric detective in Calcutta called Mr. Ford, who happens to appear in many of my other. <laughs> books and short stories. So, uh, and he's an local detective. He gets all these strange cases. One case is where everyone in the city has become kleptomania and he has to call why it's happening. So in this book, <laughs> he gets this case where a group of people has vanished in Korea and he has to himself go to Korea and he falls in a lot of trouble there. So that's another narrative of this book. And then there's the future narrative of Darkland and this past narrative of the scientist, the genetist who's working on genetically modified rice. So these four narratives come together as the novel progresses and we have mystery, adventure, uh, a bit of romance and everything. So if you read the book, uh, you will know. But now what I'm going to read to you is about this detective, this Bengali detective called Paul. Uh, Rajat, I want you to come a little bit uh, forward because yes. your voice is dipping, uh, okay. dipping while you're speaking. So uh, Thomas sir has just okay now? Uh, mentioned that. Yeah, I, it's okay. Uh, sir, is it okay? Please give a thumbs up if it is. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess it's okay because I could hear you clearly, yeah. but it was just rising and dipping. So if you could just stay a bit front and we mm -hmm. could hear you. Mm -hmm. So this section is when this detective arrives in Korea, this Bengali detective, mm -hmm. to find these lost people. And he's accosted by the local intelligence guys there, South Korean intelligence, they are called NIS. Yeah. And he's been interrogated at the NIS headquarters. Yeah. The waves of questioning left him busy. The naked lamp hanging from the ceiling of the small windowless room turned him blind. Metal chairs were scraped on the floor as a new set of interrogators arrived. The sound hurt his ears. One of them took notes, another tapped his pen a thousand times on the table. He felt disoriented when the suited man suddenly stopped the tapping. The silence was like a slap on his face. When did you join the Communist Party? They asked. Who is your leader? Why did you come to this country? Who sent you here? What do you know about the lost tourists? It went on and on, repeated through the day and late into the evening. Often they were threatening. No one knows you are in our custody. So answered peacefully, hissed and hated. Leaning forward so close that Ford could smell the kimchi on his breath. He told them that there has been a mistake and wanted to see Officer Kim. There are hundreds of Kims in NIS. Their hard faces would crack into a grin as they looked at each other. Then they left him for an hour alone in the empty interrogation room with the heavy metal door, the table and three chairs, one of which always remained empty. 
Which year did you go to North Korea? This guy had been to North Korea. How did they find out, you wonder? It was so long ago. Ford told him about joining the Communist Party at home when he was in college. He had been involved in student politics and quickly rose to the ranks. I worked for the party for a number of years, earning a small wage, but this was years ago. I became a mid-ranking official in the party. That was when the party selected some young leaders to be sent as part of an official delegation to North Korea for the World Student Youth Festival. How many from your country? One of them asked, as the others other civil seriously in his notebook. Thirty delegates from my country, thousands from other nations. The younger agents studied him coldly as the others asked, Were any of these people part of the tourist group? Perhaps they are children? Caught hot for a while. If he told them the truth, they would never let him go. There was now no way to contact him or the embassy. He had to fight this out alone. The strength was sagging from the barrack of Europe. How could he tell them about the disillusionment that turned him into a private eye? That he had no trust with the communists for years. Yet, some of the comrades from those who remained among his most trusted allies. They were his final port of call in a crisis. They were the card he kept close to his chest as he navigated the alleys of crime and corruption in the dangerous back lanes of the city. Two of them from the group of lost tourists were party members. They are much senior to me, God said, slowly measuring his word. The interrogator didn't change his expression, but God's strained eyes could notice the tightening jaw muscles. What are their names? Omar Bosch and his wife Priya Bosch said slowly. He was getting down, he was getting drawn into trouble, which was not his game. What did those cooks want from him? Where has the bloody king disappeared? He reckoned it must be evening by then, but he didn't want to ask them the time. That would harden their resolve to break his defense, though he himself was not quite sure what what there was to defend at that point. This is all a big mistake, he told them for the nth time. I want to speak to my ambassador, he repeated again and again. Where is Officer Kim? I am a private investigator appointed by near ones of the lost tourists. It all seemed to fall on deaf ears. Describe the area in Pyongyang where you were staying. Huh? Who all did you meet? That was a decade ago. What ceremonies did you attend? He remembered the glimpses of the official functions, then a stroll along the banks of the Taedong Hill under a tower Pyongyang on that spring morning, its wide river and distant hills, its parks and monuments had looked pretty. But in his mind, the city had acquired an aura of greatness as the capital of a nation founded on communist principles. He had stood transfixed, watching the distant hills from the top, watching the city, heart pumping with the madness of first love. He remembered the imposing tower block where they were put up with comrades from many nationalities, the clanging of the trolley buses on the street, and the eye-catching Kim il flower arrangement at the official ceremony. Tell us what you did while you were in Pyongyang. Don't leave out any details. The man with the silvery hair barked, snatching him out of his recollections. The people looked him straight in the eye. I think it is the question. God had been asked through the day. The other interrogators and officer with a narrow forehead tapped his pen impatiently as he waited for his response. So this goes on, and then he was rescued by one of these NIO guys who he had contacted earlier. And finally, he returns to his hotel. It's a hotel called Utopia Hotel in Seoul. And then they yeah. just reached each other where uh, he has dinner somewhere. Paul had brought beef, bibimbap, and two stiff drinks in a backstreet restaurant thronged by working class people before taking the elevator to a strangely decorated room at Utopia Hotel. He thought he had switched off the TV, but still he could see their faces. They were now sitting in chairs, circling his bed. Circle after concentric circles, the dark-suited men, some with black ties, 
a hard glitter in their eyes. Thick necked, big, rough hands like metal spade, some with teacup ears, and each one of them held a bunch of Kimilsungia blooms between his fingers. They sniffed the flowers from time to time, and then they looked up at him. Not all together, but one at a time, and slowly, letting the words from, letting the words form without hurry, fixing him with the stare. They all asked him one by one, "When did you join the party?" So that's how it begins for him after he arrives in Korea. And uh, if there are any other questions, I can answer now. And if there is still time, I will read another question, a very short one. Yeah. Uh, so there is another question. Uh, they uh, Niyati again asked that what are some of your favorite dystopian pieces of literature and film? See, uh, I'm not much into films, but dystopian. Uh, of course, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. It starts with that. Then Zamyatin's We. You know the Russian author Zamyatin. You can know Zamyatin's We. That was uh, actually a model both for Huxley and Orwell's 1984, and they had a, a bit of fight between them. So Huxley says that. Orwell has talked from that. Orwell said that Huxley might have taken from. So, Jamieson is really, really important, which I have liked. And then Cormac McCarthy's road. Other dystopian works, you know, uh, there is this Liz Jensen, Liz Jensen's uh, Rapture. This is one book that I've liked much. Then all of Margaret Atwood's work, especially you know this Oryx and Freak and that trilogy of hers. Uh, Barbara Lessing's uh, it's called Mara and Dan. About uh, about the brother sister duo in a future Africa. It's called Ifri, which is uh, under the uh, the the world has passed through an ice age and Africa is uh, riven by civil war. Countries are broken, mm -hmm. people escaping, and climate change has happened. Severe. It's about twenty thirty thousand years in the future. So that's a beautiful uh, you know dystopian uh, novel by Doris uh, Lessing. So all of these I, I read whatever I get. Yeah. Uh, hoping Yati has got enough and more recommendations now for the current period. So, could we request you to read another bit, your favorite bit? <laughs> yeah, I read from the beginning where it's uh, it's this dystopian city which is actually Calcutta, though it's never named. Uh, now there's the a socialist dictatorship is running Darkland. This huge. Uh, Super, uh, it's a continent. It's almost uh, uh, whole of Asia, and it's uh, ruled from Calcutta. Calcutta doesn't have a name anymore. It's called City One because yeah. uh, the rulers don't want people to be emotionally attached to places. So nothing has any names. Roads don't have names. How a bridge is called Bridge One, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and uh, what I'm reading here is uh, this guy uh, Henry David, the green activist. He, he mm -hmm. arrived. From Greenland to Darkland to meet this uh, police hitman at night, because he has this stash of diaries with him, and they they reach his flat. They have something to eat, and then in the morning, uh, this uh, Henry David, who is an Englishman, he says that he wants to see the river, which is the Hooghly, mm -hmm. and they set out from the flat. So this uh, little section I'm going to read to you, which also gives glimpses of climate change and you know that the city is partly drowned. They locked the plat and walked down to the square of the Martis, with its rows of old care homes and hospitals. Everywhere there are old care homes because people are aging fast because of this illness. Over the years, little barter and pawn shops had sprung up upon the pavements, and the ancient department stores opened by the British were now doing a roaring business, selling automatic wheelchairs, licensed young blood. And cheap embedded smart chamber pots, which analyzed and kept stock of urine output, with an option to share the data on fossil book, the old people's social networks. The Darkland Area Authority had let this neighborhood be used for catering to the needs of the elderly, shifting administrative offices to the east of the city, where there was less water scarcity and a regular delivery of fresh food from Greenland. It's very hot today, isn't it? Henry said. They were walking towards the square, negotiating, doddering men, roaming aimlessly, their empty eyes bereft of the will to live. We will have rains later in the evening. 
Henry looked thoughtfully at the signboards of care homes along the street. You have to see what I brought with me, and perhaps then only we should talk. Surely. Your sole ticket, sir, a young woman with bright blue eyes had stopped them. This is a genetically modified human. She was wearing a protector's white uniform, an automatic weapon was slung on her shoulder. Captain Old recognized the dish baby immediately. He had seen her at the station the night before. Must be from a new batch, he told himself, because he had never seen that bluish glow in their eyes. Henry had stopped in his tracks. He looked at Krava Four with a mix of amusement and distaste, and was going to say something when Old cut in. He is a clean lander. Krava Four turned to face Old. And you? Do you have authorization to have intercourse with a clean lander? What? Old realized she meant social integrity. She could create a lot of trouble for them if she wanted. He couldn't let the situation escalate, and so he said, "I am not with him." We just happened to be walking in the same direction. I was trying to help out a tourist. Is that true? She asked him. He nodded grimly. Ah, a tourist. What kind of a splice is that? A splice is a genetically modified organism, a human being. Are you an improved version of the Sonmis that malfunction? But you don't seem to be functioning too well, are you? It looked like Henry's eyes would pop off their socket. I don't want to get into this, but the Greenlander here is a blood baby and not a slice. He is a tourist. He is here to check out our country. Kravapo listened and nodded slowly. She seemed to understand and turned to face him. I hope this is true. She studied their faces. Now run, and I don't want to see the two of you together again. They were nearing the river, which had swelled over the decades, taking with it the high court building. And the town hall. From the eastern edge of the Marty Square, they could see rusty state boats skimming across the surface of the river, powered by black market diesel. Of course, I'm waiting to see what you got. Otherwise, I wouldn't have responded to your messages and taken the trouble to receive you at the station. But I don't buy that story of the lost antidote. Old said, as they crossed the street and went down to the river bank. There were many people sitting here, old men and women, hordes of the jobless, confident tricksters with eagle eyes, out-of-job actors just like Mongols, and bartermen with their assorted stock of Greenland puff pipes, mouldy long loaf, three-headed hilsas, Tibetan wheat and millet, stolen prosthetics, memory pills, and pilfered young blood. The hilsas are mutated because of a nuclear war that had happened. A crowd had gathered at the water's edge, watching a juggler showing his tricks. The churches and the railway godowns had all been washed away, and the black water that flowed ceaselessly towards the bay carried no memories of all that it had taken with it. Not even the, that of the city's founder, which had vanished in the hungry current. Captain Old and the Englishman stood on the half-sunk pavement beside the neoclassical pile of the governor's care home. And watched the young juggler from a distance. People crowded around him. Thieves who had fallen in love with Nastri, boatmen, and fresh-faced couples, their buttery skin glowing in the evening light. He was just a boy, fresh-faced with limpid brown eyes, a tattered red jersey embroidered with Manchester United logo over an outside khaki short. Over outside khaki shorts. With his two little hands, he was juggling five long bones, white as chalk. The bones flew through the air, returning to his practice grip, and the crowd cheered, "Pura!" Throwing at this little boy mouldy bread, pieces of mouldy bread, and ration shop toffee. The femurs and the tibias flew in a circle, rising and falling through the amber light. The guarders of the half-sunk bridge tree gleamed like the filthy spirits of an aquatic monster. Trapped in the poison river, while Henry began to tell Captain Old about his friend, the Indian geneticist Tonmay Shen, and what had happened that day when the end of the world's fog had wrapped itself around the small English town, he stopped midway. He was asking Old if he could tell him anything about an incident in Korea. 
the lost traveler it was so long ago people hardly remember these days he said they looked at each other realizing the irony of the comment old nodded vaguely and looked away he was too engrossed watching the juggler while watching the boy a thought had occurred to captain could those be the bones of the city's founders a christian who had fallen in love and married a hindu prince when the river burst through its banks many graves on the river side were washed away and it had been party time for bone marching to dive into the turbulent currents to rescue the skeletons of old englishmen but fishermen out on the water lying in wait for the three headed hilsa said the dead englishmen swam faster than the skeleton traders and were often rescued by boat ships flying the white and sign so as uh, you do here <laughs> there's a bit of fantasy also here happening <laughs> yeah it's, it's i think the way that it's been described is just been it's in a way it's so surreal and you feel that this could be the future if you don't take care of what you have at hand and it just gives it just gives the possibility of the worst and you know that's what that's what we need to understand that if uh, we don't take care of the climate right now or if we didn't don't take care of our environment right now there might not be anything left to save yeah. and yeah already and i think that serious, serious trouble yeah already we are in serious yeah. trouble and what is happening outside like just as you step out of your home or even inside your home this hand washing every day or thinking about yeah. uh, uh, reading up about uh, hair cutting how to cut your hair yourself and things like that these are all dystopia you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you know, when we are writing another dystopian novel i have to put that in like uh, looking up the internet for you know uh, barber websites to uh, to learn cutting your own hair So all these things yeah. and whatever is happening, all trains have stopped. There is no, there are no flights all across the world. And if we are not careful now, if we are, if we don't stop destroying the ecosphere, cutting down trees mostly, and pumping tons and tons of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, then we are in for serious, serious stuff. More disease, more climate change, more wildfires. More drowning, more rain bombs, deluges, everything. Migration, of course. You know the Syrian war, the war that this terrible war that happened in Syria. It has been linked to climate change, actually, by some uh, analysts, because a drought mm-hmm. happened and the migration. Often these kinds of dystopian scenes, uh, even epidemics, they lead to migration, and migrations often lead to war. Even if you look at history, that's how it has happened. We have to be very careful. I don't know whether people will change, whether we'll cut down on unsustainable consumption and things like that, whether Greater Thunberg's movement will be successful, whether the good energy that is flowing through us right at this moment, as people are helping people, those who are in need, whether these good energy will join hands with the climate movement. I don't know, but let us hope that yeah, that will happen. Then we'll have a decision. Yeah, let's all just the. That's the only thing we can be right. Hopeful, hoping that we learn from our mistakes now rather than not before. Thank you, thank you for being uh, with us, Rajat, and sharing your views on climate change on the book, and as well as giving us the lecture on GMO crops, and <laughs> answering all the questions very patiently. So I think Sudeshna has just one more question. She says, "Does this pandemic atmosphere give you a thought to start another dystopian novel?" <laughs> I don't know. Actually, yeah, I am already writing something, but uh, this might not be dystopia. Actually, well, I am thinking of, I am looking at people working together. I am looking at energies in the communities, energies in climate change movement coming together to push, to push polluting industry, to change our consumption habits, to push governments to improve uh, whatever is happening all around us. To uh, to take more care of the environment to stop pumping greenhouse gas so i'm believing in the goodness in humanity to uh, uh, and in my book also the thing that i'm writing now whatever i'm writing now has all these things you know uh, looking at a better world looking at a better future you know, there is a problem there you know kim stanley robinson he is a very uh, well known uh, science fiction writer from the us and he written a lot of climate change novels and many of his books have these hopeful futures either it's happening in california or in mars 
he writes for free people and there's a lot of description here how government policy is changing for the better how people are changing but sometimes those descriptions are boring dystopia is more attractive than the right you know horror is more attractive but people sitting down in the corporation office and planning for uh, for a better world is very difficult to put down as fiction it can be boring so that's a struggle that uh, i'm going to solar pump mm. is a movement you know solar pump fiction is all about solar pump fiction is about better world with minimal technology not very advanced technologies like fusion energy but only you know solar but it's very difficult to do that to portray better world and not make the story boring so i'm doing that now and i hope to finish that maybe in two years maybe yeah yeah thank you rajat thank you so much for your time i think we don't have any more questions we've been answering it throughout the session the session is going to be uh, up on our igtv now thank god for instagram letting us send out all our live sessions to igtv straight away uh uh we all look forward to reading uh, your book and i'm hoping that those people who have been watching uh us today are inspired to pick up the book it's available online it's available on a lot of online platforms scrib storytel uh amazon uh please go pick up rajat's book the butterfly effect go follow him on his social media channels he's at rajat choudhury on uh, twitter and instagram as well as on facebook and he's got a, a website as well which is rajachaudhry.net so go look it up read his articles and understand more about climate change thank you rajat for joining us thank you bansi thank you kitab khana thank you thank you bye bye So tomorrow we have yet another session starting at five thirty. We have uh, Mr. Alok Lal and Ansila Thomas from Hatchet talking about his book, Bankable Knockoffs. Please join us tomorrow. Thank you, Sudeshna. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for all of you who joined us today. <laughs>